we have two more weeks uh, left of class. One of the things that we're going to be focused on in the last couple weeks of class is deploying your application. In other words, how do you get it in the hands of people to use? You know, we have created these applications and, you know, how would you deliver it to someone for them to use it? And keeping in mind that you don't want someone to have to go and use the command line, for example, to run your code, you know, or anything like that. And you don't want it to be a requirement that they actually have Java, uh, the Java uh, development kit. You just uh, would want to require them the Java runtime engine. So you'd want to make it fairly easily. And there are things that allow you to put together uh, releases and install uh, programs and so on and so forth, but we're going to sort of focus on the Java side of it. And uh, there are a couple of different ways, and probably the most straightforward and traditional, I guess, of it involves creating uh, a jar, which is a Java archive file. And uh, you can compile things into jars, and you can create your application that way. And then anyone that has a Java runtime engine, or at least the right version of the Java runtime engine, will be able to run it. So one of the things we're going to do today is create a jar. <clears throat> you can do this manually from the command line. It's not that hard. But we're going to use uh, a GUI to do it. We're going to use uh, an IDE uh, of Eclipse to do it. And uh, we'll do a few other things when we're in there. Uh, the la other few weeks of class will be concerned talking about some other ways of getting it, including web-based ways, using JSP pages and Java servlets and the like. So I have this code that I did in a previous example. And I'm going to start up Eclipse, which is a Java IDE. And what do I mean by an IDE? It's an integrated development environment. Um, an analogy of it to the Microsoft world would be um, Visual Studio. So it's simply a tool that allows you to do some things very easily. Am I getting a warning? One of the things I have to, you have to do is you have to choose a workspace. A workspace is where you're going to put um, preferences as well as the code that you use. So I'm going to use, I'll use this one. Okay, let's choose another one then. create a new folder called workspace and we'll use that one. All right, so I'm going to create a new project. New Java project, and I will call it, this is the high-low game that I'm going to bring in. <laughs> By the way, it looks like I got the error because I somehow inadvertently clicked Eclipse twice. And in two instances, we were trying to use the same workspace, and that wasn't okay. So I'm creating, I moved my workspace to be on the desktop. So I'm going to create a project called High Low Game. I can use 
this as a JRE, create separate folders for class and other files and so on. I'll click finish and there you'll see my project. I should anyhow. Let's try that again. Let me go back and try to open that project. Oh, there we go. Just took forever. All right. We're going to have, we have our Java systems library with resources that we can use. We also have our source library. Now, I already have some code, right, that I wrote last time. So we're going to use that code, and we're going to bring it into Eclipse. All right. Once we bring it into Eclipse, we'll play around with it, and we'll see some of the advantages that an IDE brings. But I'm going to import it. Now I'm going to go to File, Import, and I will do this to bring in code that already exists. In other words, code that we wrote from a previous example that we did not use Eclipse for. I'm going to Import, and I'm going to Import General and I'm going to choose file system because that's what I'm doing. I'm not bringing it in from another Eclipse project and I'm not bringing it in from an archive or anything like that. I'm just opening files. So open files, I get to pick the directory. Oops. It's a directory. I'll select it. Then I get to pick what I want to bring in. So I want to bring in to my Eclipse project all the Java files and these PNG files too for good measure. We'll see how that works. Yeah, we want that one too. Not going to bring any of the compiled stuff in. I'm going to bring in the Java code. And I'm going to click finish. And it brings it in. And it put my code in a default package. All right. Now, if I want to run this, I could go and click Run As a Java Application, and I have to pick which class I want to be my initial class, right? What does it take for a class to be my initial class? What is needed in that class? A main method, right. So public, static, void, main. So what it showed me is it showed me the three classes in my application that have a public, static, void, main. So I would assume I want the GUI one, so I'll pick the GUI, and I'm good to go. And there's our GUI. not showing the images. I'm not entirely sure if that's the version of the code I have or what, but we'll ignore the images for now. All right. So I have this and I have it working. So if I wanted to essentially compile it and create a Java archive, I would go and do this. File, export. And I would pick under that, I want a jar file. What's more, I'll pick a runnable jar file. All right, I'll click Next. I 
I have to pick what I want to be the main class. Destination for it. I'll put it on the desktop for good measure. And I'll save it as uh, HL for high low. Save. And I click finish. Finish with warnings. See details. Export with compile warnings. Not really sure what those were. Oh, down here we can see. Oh, one thing is never used. Yeah, I, I have some things that I put in there, imports that I left in there that were never used. So um, it gave me the warnings. So now I have this jar, and I double click on it, and up comes the application. All right. Still not showing the images. Let me try putting the images in the same folder as this. Let's see if that works. Yeah, that works. So the images are in the same folder as that. And if you had an install routine, you could you could create a place for it and all that. All right. So we're good to go. So that creates a jar, and a jar is a Java archive. If we notice, there are a couple other things that get created too. Let's peek in our workspace. Under the high-low game, we have a settings, which has some preferences from Eclipse. We have a bin that contain the actual compiled things. We have our source, which has our source code. And that's it. I thought it created a manifest file as well, but I don't see that, so I'm not sure. Let me try to create the jar this way. Go to export. This actually is a little different than when I ran it uh, on my Mac, and it could be um, the Mac issue. Let's see. Export class and resources. Put the jar somewhere else. We'll call it high low two. Next, export with, save the description. Uh, here's a manifest that you can generate. If you create a runnable one, it must do this sort of behind the scenes. But you can generate a manifest file. I'm going to save the manifest in the workspace, and I'm going to give a name, manifest.txt. And I have to, again, specify the main class. And I want the GUI to be the main class. Um, manifest file path must be absolute. Okay, there we go. And I can click Finish. And it does its thing. And we have Notice it created the manifest file in there. If we look at the manifest file, it contains just something simple like a version of the code in the main class. There's other information you can have there, but since ours is a pretty simple app, 
um, that's taken care of. We get a jar just the same and it can run and display the results. So that's one thing I want you to do for your last assignment. For your last assignment I want you to take either your next to last assignment uh, and create a jar for it. Um, if you're struggling with that assignment and you can't get it done, then take any other uh, assignment, preferably one with a GUI, and create a jar from that. All right. Uh, I don't want to penalize you if you didn't finish the previous lab. So, you know, this should be a fairly straightforward five points because you really just have to go in, use Eclipse to generate a um, a um, uh, a jar. A jar again, Java Archive. It takes and stores the compiled version of all your classes in an archive file. If you look at it, it's not going to be machine readable. Or I mean, it's not going to be human readable. It's compiled code and it's compressed compiled code. Now, there's another th cool thing that you can do with Eclipse. And with this jar, could you get it on like your Mac or your Windows? Should be able to, yeah. Should be able to if you have a jar. Uh, the only is issue I would see would be possibly there being versioning issues if you uh, created it with a, with a later version of uh, the Java runtime engine or the Java development kit and I had an earlier version. Then that might cause problems, but otherwise it shouldn't be a problem. Now, another cool thing that we can do is we can export to Java Docs. And Java Docs are documentation for Java classes done in a very specific standard way. And if you visit the Oracle website and view their documentation on classes, this is the kind of stuff that you see. So let's click Next. I'm going to create Java doc for everything, even the stuff that's private, not necessarily just the public stuff. And I can pick a destination, and I'll put it on a folder. Let's create it. Specify the Java doc command. I have no idea what it's hoping for there. I have a different version of Java, so I'm going to have to find mine. This is very different than when I ran this on my Mac. I'm getting different screens, different results. JDK 1.8.0. I can do 
finish. Do you want to update? Yes to all. And it goes and it's gonna it's gonna generate the Java doc. So creates a whole bunch of HTML pages and the home page is called index.html. So I click on that and I see essentially the kind of documentation that you see for Oracle. This is really good because it's a consistent format. And um, it's good where you can put um, um, for your developers that are going to be using your classes, they'll be seeing your documentation in the same format as they see the standard Java documentation. So it's kind of cool to use this. And it does a lot of the work for you for free. Now, there are things that you can do, all right? This doesn't really say what this function does, all right? Now, there's ways that you can add comments to can I generate Java document contacts from the an Eclipse plugin. Let me go into my dice class, and I will put And I can do the same thing for get following this format. And then when I go in and, and export to Java Docs. it will create the documentation and there's my comments in there. So that makes for a little more descriptive 
uh, documentation. If you put those comments at the, at the start of uh, the header uh, of the function. All right. So I think that's your last assignment is to um, create um, just a jar from one of your previous examples. Should be just a matter of importing your code and um, then creating Java docs and, and that's it. Now what else can we do with Eclipse? All right. One of the things that we haven't talked about and we can, we can start now is, um, you know, besides the normal features of an IDE where we have IntelliSense, as I type something in, it will show me the value that I could do for that object. It will show me the um, methods available on the dice object. by typing in D dot, you see a list of all the things that are available and so on. And if you have a syntax error, it will highlight it for you. D dot roll five. It'll tell you there's something wrong with that. Namely, the method roll is not applicable for the argument in. And it'll give you some quick fixes. All right, get rid of the argument and all that. So pretty nifty. So as a standard IDE, you can create things and it uses IntelliSense to allow you to finish things and so on. I don't believe so, no. In other words, if we go into this, yeah, there's no real like visual mode of it. All right. There's possible there could be plugins that would allow you to do that, but it's not a standard part of Eclipse. One nice thing that is one thing that is good though is you can divide your things into packages easily. Now you don't need packages, you don't need a GUI to do packages, but it's a good place to talk about it because it sort of does the work for you. The idea of a package is that you can group like things together. All right, you can group like things together and put them in a package. And that's really what you're importing when you import something. You're importing the, cl the class from the package in which it lives. So I could actually put each of these Java classes into a package that makes sense for me. So I'm going to delete dice test. Because again, that was my test code. I don't need it in like a package that I'm going to release. So I'm going to delete that. I'm going to delete the high low game test. And I'm going to put the high low game and the dice in it in one package, and I'm going to put the game GUI in another package. That way you have a division between the user interface and your problem logic, problem domain logic. Now, package names are generally used uh, using, are generally done using the sort of reverse URL concept. All right? Here's the idea. You want your package to be unique. So you want so that your class is the only class in the world that has that name. Now, that doesn't makes sense on the surface, right? Because Dice, there's going to be a bunch of developers and they might all have a class named Dice. All right? You, what if you're using code from one of those other developers and you want to make sure you use your Dice object instead of their Dice object? That's where coming into packages come in and you can import your packages as opposed to theirs and you can say where a particular object is going to come from. So I'm going to create a package using the reverse domain. And the idea of the reverse domain is like this. The domain at Lorain County Community College for doing web access is 
Lorraine ccc.edu all right now we use sort of a reverse domain where we get more and more specialized this is what's called a high level domain or first level domain so a package name might look something like this That might be a package name. Now, as long as LC is maintaining and coordinating the efforts right, that should be unique to me on Earth, right? Because there's no other organization that's LorraineCCC.edu, right? And within that, we can specialize further. I'm in the engineering, business, and IT division. And then within that, I'm in the CISS department, and my name is Zellers. So, if there was a Zellers even in Arts and Humanities, they would have a different code for that. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to put in my dice, I'm going to put a package, and that's the very first line. Yeah. EDU, Lorraine, CCC, EBIT. CISS Zellers. No, it's it's the second one shouldn't be there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now notice it's griping about that. It's griping about it because I'm in the default package and I'm saying this code belongs to this package. So I have to go here and create a package. And go new, package. And I will put that in, and I hope I get it right. EDU, Lorraine, CCC. Dot ebit dot CISS dot Zellers. I'll create that. And now I'm going to drag this object into that package. So now that's in there. Um, I will then go in and create another package for the GUI. And I can drag the GUI into there. And I can drag the high-low game into there. And I just have to make sure that the package matches, the package I define up here matches the package that it's in. So that one does, and that one does. So they all match. Uh, I believe the system did do it when I dragged it over. I think the first one I typed it in and it gave me an error because I did it sort of in the wrong order. I added the package to the source code, then I went and created the package. If I create the package and then drag it over, it puts it in by itself. All right, I got rid of my warnings, which is always a good idea, especially if it's something simple. All right, now what I have to do though is notice that it also automatically added the import of this guy. Because a class can find classes within its own package without qualifying it. So for example, notice my high-low game 
just refers to the dice object. Doesn't import anything for it. Why? Because dice and high low game are in the same package. Now, game GUI uses the high low game class. So it needs to import the high low game class because it's in another package. All right, so it's in the same package. And what we've effectively been doing the same time uh, all along is we've kept things just in the single default package. So everything was in the same folder, so it could find everything there. All right, so now if we go and run this, it still works. All right. And we're good to go. Now, if we want, go ahead. Can you make a change and then rerun it? Does it keep it compiled automatically? Yes. Yes, it does. Uh, and then I can go in and I can make a jar again from this by going to export, pick a jar, next. Each time I'm making a jar with a different name just to show you the, the output of it. Take the manifest that. It's recreating the manifest. And now I have my high low jar three, which again still works. All right. Now, um, I probably should go and redo the Java docs because I've moved things around in the new packages and my old Java docs are going to be obsolete. So I'll go to File, Export, and say I want Java docs. There's my path to that. I'll actually create documentation two. And it's does doing its thing, and it's good to go, and it's making all those things. And if I go into documentation two, oh, there we go. I think. I have shows me that it's in a path uh, or it's in a package of EDU, GUI, and so on. So you can generate that documentation. I may not have generated all the documentation because it only seems to do that. It only seems to do this one. I had highlighted that one. I should have done it up here and export Java doc. Now it's doing a lot more, I think. And my documentation would include, yeah, the two different packages. I only did the Java docs for the one package the first time. I can see the contents of it and go view that. And I see my little comments there. All right, let's look at what you get in the workspace because this is what you will turn into me, all right? 
Um, I take that back. This is what you need to keep when you create this because the workspace is where all the action is. You have the name of your project here. Inside that, there's going to be bin, which is your compiled code. All right. There will be folders for each of the packages that you have, and your pile, compile code goes in there. So if you remember, before we just had that bin file, and all the class files were in the one bin folder. Now, because we've separated things into different packages, we have different folders for the compiled code, where the compiled code goes. Yes. Yeah, it's not like it magically goes out to that domain or anything. It's, it's just used as an identifier. It would be similar to like if you sign up for an Amazon account. You use your email address. Does that mean it's emailing you or something? No. It, it just knows that, well, an email ought to be unique, so therefore, um, you know, um, same thing with that. The domain, yeah, you could still use that. Um, our source also is divided into... Each of the packages has its own folder for source. All right. So this should be enough for you to do that last assignment. And um, you have a little while to do it, right? Uh, is due, I think, the week of finals. So you do have a bit of time. Um, but essentially, all you're going to do is generate generate a uh, jar file and generate uh, Java docs for this and then just upload that and I should be able to run it. Okay, um, what we'll talk about in future classes of which we have a handful left is Some of the other technologies that are used to distribute a uh, Java code, other than just making a jar and then creating an installation program um, that uses a jar. And these would involve web technologies like JSP, Java Servlet, uh, and so on. It's where you have Java code, but you put it out as part of a web server, and effectively they're running Java programs through your web server. It would be similar to like how we run C Sharp programs through our web server when we use ASP.NET, but again, using a different technology. All right, that's all I had for today. Um, please take advantage of the remainder of time to work on stuff that you still have to turn in. And we'll see you Wednesday. <laughs>